Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I appreciate it's a horrible night to leave the house, so thanks for coming all the way up here. Uh, Politics Society is uh, very pleased to be hosting this event with the Green Party. Um, just a little bit how the structure is going to work. Uh, Molly's going to speak to us about dispelling the myths of the EU. She's going to speak for about 15 minutes or so. Uh, then I'm going to give some follow-up questions, uh, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. The aim tonight is to be about 90 minutes or so. So the first half of the talk is going to be pretty much focused on the EU. So I'd ask for the first questions we have, they could be kind of more based on the EU. After that, we're going to open questions on pretty much anything, uh, so we'll see sort of where it takes us then. Um, um, so I'm just going to run through five main areas. Firstly, constitutional stuff. Then things about the economy. Then the EU and, and waste. Then something about migration. And finally, some issues about security. The amount of... Um, influence that the Parliament has depends on what kind of topic it is. So with some things we can actually block what happens, with other things they just ask us an opinion and then they can ignore it. So there is a sort of spread of um, power for the Parliament, but most goes through what they call um, ordinary decision making procedure and that is a negotiation between the three bodies and it ends up in a what they call a trial of where we're actually negotiating that. So if stuff goes wrong you can't complain that it's because Europe's not democratic. It's basically because people are voting for the wrong people, in my view. The Parliament has a lot of very right-wing people in it because a lot of people in Europe decided to vote that way. Well, you can complain about that, and obviously all of us try to change that, or most people in this room, but you can't complain that it's not democratic. Um, so, next myth, most of our laws come from Brussels. Obviously, this is related to that first myth. This is also completely untrue. So the House of Commons Library, which is an independent resource, found that the actual proportion of laws that govern our lives that are made in Brussels is 13.2%. So, you know, that's, that's the sort of proportion in terms of if you're concerned about sovereignty. Still the overwhelming amount of legislation is passed in this country. We don't know how many jobs are actually going to be lost, but to me it would, it would be a problem actually being part of that single market and not being part of the decision making around that single market. So that's something we know for sure. If we were to continue to be part of the, the European single market, we would have to meet all the rules that we have to meet now, basically, except that if those rules were changed, you wouldn't have me there arguing about that. You wouldn't have our Prime Minister trying to change the way those rules are made in our national self-interest. So that would be, I think, a major disadvantage, unless we decided we didn't want to sell into the single market at all, um, which then I think we could be pretty sure would result in a great loss of jobs. Most big businesses are supportive of us staying in. Interestingly, the hedge funds are now arguing for us coming out, but a colleague of mine who used to work on the dark side and has now become our finance advisor told me that's just because the best way to make a profit is to create instability, so who knows, we'll see how that turns out. Uh, is the European Union wasteful? Well, this is another area where there are a huge amount of bogus figures being thrown around. Our own government estimates that EU membership is worth 3,000 a year to every British family. And the budget for the, oh, the whole of the EU budget is just 1% of GDP. So that's compared to 49% spent by national governments. So, in other words, 2% of our public spending each year is spent on the EU. We do put that much money in, but we also get a lot back just in terms of direct transfers of cash, even if we don't think about all the savings in terms of um, legislation and standards and, and so on. So um, let's just have a little think about migration now. I think we should really be celebrating the fact that we live in a stable part of the world that people want to come to. And in fact, in terms of the dealing with the, the migration crisis, it's another example of what I was talking about before, where Almost immediately we saw the scale of the problem. The Parliament and the Commission agreed policies and the stumbling block has always been the national governments who, who don't really have the courage to take on the right-wing voices in their countries and say, yes, this is a historic duty and we need to take these refugees. The migrants who come from the EU to this country are actually a positive benefit. I think the other side of that is to say they may be displacing British people from the workforce. So I wouldn't say it's for everybody a, a benefit, but certainly in terms of calculations of contribution to welfare compared to welfare claims, certainly um, migrants from the EU are making a positive contribution. 
But I just wanted to close by talking a little bit about security and about what the European Union is actually for. I think people are finding the wrong scapegoat. They feel unsettled, they feel they've lost identity, they feel that the world's moving very rapidly. But these things are a result of economic changes, particularly the globalization of the economy. And because that happened at the same time as we were members of the European Union, people are blaming the European Union. But these things will be just the same if we were outside. And in fact, we would be a lot more vulnerable, I think, if we weren't part of that large and powerful club. But my own view is that in this time of crisis, we need to stand more strongly with our European neighbours and we need to cooperate with them for the sake of mutual security. And for that reason, I think never has it been more important that we are members of the European Union. Thank you. Being part of the EU, we don't have complete control over that immigration policy. Is there going to get a point where net immigration will just be too high? And if so, kind of what number would that be? Um, so, I, I can't remember the number for people who are living here who come from the European Union, but it's much smaller than that number. And if you compare, if you compare that number with people living outside the European Union who are British, then the numbers are much closer, or there may even be more British people living abroad. And at what point do we have to say, yeah, well, you know, we accept that the world's very unequal and it's our responsibility because we've been exploiting your country for hundreds of years or because we've caused climate change or because we've, you know, had a war which has destroyed your country. And we start taking responsibility for that as something domestic rather than thinking, well, that's foreign policy. We can do what we like in somebody else's country and that will stay over there. I guess going back to this kind of global village idea, um, in terms of how you uh, cope with the effects of that at home, I think housing is an interesting one. So in the last year, house prices have gone up by about 5%, and the amount of houses that have been built have gone down by 5%. So I'm wondering, if you take, say, Green Party policy, is that generally is to not build on green sites, is that going to be a realistic policy with the number of people coming in if it continues as it is, to only build on brown sites, which hasn't really been that successful in the last 50 years? You can have your own private family spaces around communal facilities. That is completely sensible, and that's how university accommodation often works. Um, you know, we should be thinking outside the box. Instead of just filling space with, you know, every house has a kitchen, every house has a garage, every house has a... Why not just get that inefficiency, combine these things, and it would be cheaper to live that way as well. Okay, uh, yes, question here at yeah. the front. Oh, on the topic of uh, tax avoidance, uh, it seems to me that the EU is weak on this because it allows countries like Luxembourg and Ireland to offer cheaper rates which, which, the, which the Googles and the Starbucks of the world may make use of. What, what are they doing towards harmonising? Well, this is quite a good example of what I was talking about before, isn't it? Because actually the Commission is trying to move in that direction, but the countries like Luxembourg and Ireland, which is, you know, has an 8.5% corporate tax and deliberately uses special tax deals to encourage corporations to go there. And there's, there's a bunch of countries um, that operate a bit like tax havens but within the European Union, they block any movement towards more harmonised tax policy across the Union. And so does Britain, actually. David Cameron's uh, agreements with the EU, um, as an insider, how well has that been received uh, by the other uh, European uh, MEPs? Yeah, well, that is, a, that is an interesting question, because even in our group, people weren't very happy about that, and they're probably the, <laughs> more than the most sort of pro-British of all the groups. Um, we're just always doing special pleading, aren't we? We're always asking for special deals. You know, we've got the ring bait. We're not happy with this. We'll have that. We don't, we don't go in and sort of negotiate for the best in a shared way, which is what most of the other countries do. We basically stand there and say, you know, wave the handbag. You're going to give us this or else we're off. And that is such a bad way to negotiate. And I just think, you know, people talk about us having a relationship with the EU as if we're not a part of it. And I think that really David Cameron's proved that it's just a dysfunctional relationship. You know, it's the kind of relationship that says to, to your partner, if you don't do X, I'm leaving. And that's a solely a bad relationship. In mm -hmm. Do you think uh, David Cameron's performance have, will they ever see the light of day, do you think, or are they going to get lost somewhere along the way? Uh, I don't think his performance will be wanted, particularly. No. I mean, uh, you know, he's there cutting work protection, environmental protection, all that sort of stuff. And that, he's keeping all the stuff that's bad about it. Europe and getting rid of some of the good stuff we're trying to. So, no, what bothers me about this referendum is oh, the referendum is about a renegotiated Europe or nothing. Well, where's the referendum on how Europe was before Cameron made it worse? Mm -hmm. you know, we, we're not given that question. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, let's go to the floor then. Any questions? Yep, start the front here. So if the, uh, if the trick of politics is to get people interested in politics, maybe we've got a whole nation saying, so how are we supposed to express our interest in politics? We can't withdraw our labour from, from anything because we're not being personally attacked. We can support doctors, but you know, to what effect? Um, how, like, if, if, how, how do we reintroduce an actual democratic capability to I, I would say these sound like pointless things to do, but do write your MP. I mean, they, you know, write to everyone, write to the Lords, they never get letters, always write to the Lords, they always write back, it's lovely. Um, <laughs> write, you know, talk to the council, um, but definitely make a noise and go and support pickets, you know, go and stand at the IUH on Wednesday if you can, and, and be there with them and show numbers, because actually one thing that politicians don't like is a restless public. That's the thing with democracy, you know, you've really got to... You've got to get involved and make it happen. And I think the problem in this country is people have been trained into thinking it's a horse race and there's only two horses. Let's take a few more questions. Was there a question at the back? Yes, go here, right. right back. Um, if, uh, I'm pro, I'm pro EU. If the, if the referendum results uh, vote to stay in by the 60 or 70 percent majority of the rap, why won't the Commission just say that? I don't like the word reform because okay. it's, you know, a confusing word. Well, isn't it? What does it mean? What, what's happening in, in Europe at the moment? As I understand it, the last poll that I wasn't in, sadly, made some very good progressive movements in terms of strengthening environmental legislation um, and, yeah, basically in, enhancing. What, what I see as suitable controls over corporate power. In this parliament, they're absolutely trying to reverse that. So they have what they call the better regulation agenda. And they would call this a reform agenda. Obviously, I wouldn't. Um, and so that is about basically unpicking a lot of that good stuff that, that protects the things we value in life. And I think the most important, if coming back to the question about reform, at least in terms of change, I think the most important question to resolve is how, how do you balance between countries that are part of the Eurozone and therefore need to build stronger political institutions just to make that single currency work, and countries that are never going to join the Euro. And those questions have been fudged for too long, and that's, that's not helping them resolve the Eurozone crisis, and it's also not helping us um, have the right amount of influence over economic policy. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, thank you very much for coming and for staying. Thank you very much. Thank you.